All right, well, thank you. Today we're going to talk about conveyors and part feeders for manufacturing. So this is an area that I feel like um, maybe it's overlooked a little bit when we talk about automation and industry 4.0, uh, but it is really an important part that kind of you know, ties the technology together with um, the, the flow on the manufacturing floor. So I've got a few videos. I'm going to tell you a little bit about MEP and iSmart. Um, before we get to that, um, who we are, Purdue MEP, those of you who don't know, the division of Purdue TAP. Um, we've got experts from industry uh, who pretty much you know, work with small and medium-sized manufacturers in Indiana exclusively. A variety of businesses, uh, food and beverage to general industrial, automotive, and aerospace. Um, you know, so what we do is we look to create value and impact. Uh, we do that through increased revenue, uh, profitability and competitiveness, public workshops, custom on-site training, and project consulting services are some of the ways we do that. Uh, and we look for our clients to report uh, the impact in the form of new sales, uh, new product launches, market growth, jobs created, jobs saved, um, and certainly cost reductions. A little bit about me, I come from private industry. I've been with Purdue a couple years now. Uh, I'm our additive manufacturing subject matter expert. Uh, as well as on the team of, uh, of folks who are working hard on automation right now. Um, so a little bit of quality manufacturing experience. Primarily my you know, decade or so was in a job shop environment uh, with a lot of this technology and certainly 3D printing and additive. Um, so here I've expanded to you know, more of the automation role and uh, you know, certainly get to work with additive as well, which is exciting. We'll talk about being able to print uh, robot grippers uh, custom fixtures for the automation line, things like that. A little bit of overview for today. Uh, we've got um, conveyor systems. Uh, we're going to touch on just a little bit uh, and then focus really on part feeder bowls and a flex feeder type system that is a little bit newer technology, at least um, as far as mass market goes. And we'll have time for questions at the end. So first, what is iSmart? So iSmart is kind of what is making this happen today. So um, we really got started right at the beginning of COVID, and we were obviously handcuffed like a lot of people in the way of doing events. So we've been doing this webinar series and trying to pick uh, new topics uh, that people are interested in when it comes to automation. So if you have a topic that you'd like to see us cover that hasn't been, let us know, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll definitely do our best to, to get that on the books. Um, we plan on doing in-person events again, but we, we are going to continue this webinar series at least about once a month. Uh, so look for that uh, to come. But iSmart is, is basically allowing um, allowing MEP to work with manufacturers who are looking to automate that may need some help. So these are typically the small and mediums that are new to automation and may not you know have anything other than maybe a CNC mill uh, or a laser cutter. Uh, but they're they're looking for maybe material handling solutions, simple vision systems. Uh, so we're really trying to focus that bottom bullet point on getting the quicker wins. So it's kind of starting with some you know, singles and doubles in baseball season, right? Uh, and then hopefully we can build some momentum rather than starting with this really massive project and undertaking that um, really you know can get a bad can get a bad taste in some folks' mouth if it doesn't go well uh, the first time. So. Um, so this, I think this topic is fits that category, uh, and hopefully it gets some ideas going in your head with how it might uh, apply to your facility. Uh, so what can we do for you? We've got uh, the ability to do a no cost, no obligation uh, automation assessment. Uh, what that looks like is we come on site. We can also do it remotely, but we prefer to come on site and bring along a partner of ours who is either a value added reseller or a integrator of the robot or the equipment um, so that they um, can really get a sense and give you their expert opinion on, on how an application grades out, what challenges they see, um, type of investment, capital that's required, the training that's required. We'll put all that into a report uh, so that you have that and that just hopefully saves you some time and as a, as a client um, gets you a little closer to um, making that decision uh, whether you choose to do it or not, you know, we, we're not in the business of selling equipment or, or any type of solution. We just want to be that trusted advisor. So that's really what that, uh, what this, what this program is all about, uh, is identifying the opportunities, grading them out, talking them through with you. And being on site, we get the chance to see some things that maybe, you know, that you see every day that just, you know, 
tend to, you know, with, with a fresh set of eyes, um, you know, we, we ask questions and say, kind of, why do you do things that way? So we might have some opportunities to talk about other MEP trainings that could help you. And more often than not, we find something to kind of build off on um, uh, off a visit that, that wasn't identified kind of pre-visit by the client. So um, good to come on site and, and work with your team. On the pre-deployment side, we you know, help you define the project scope and objectives. So we, we're going to ask you some a little bit of financial questions as far as your kind of what's your burdened operator rate, um, what's your what's your goal for like a payback period or ROI percentage, um, so that we can make sure we're looking at things the same way as far as being attractive or not. On um, the post-deployment side, we can we certainly want to replicate the quick wins, uh, document lessons learned. Uh, offer you training opportunities. Sometimes those can be even subsidized if you uh, if you go through us for the evaluation. So uh, that's a good opportunity to to kind of couple the the automation investment with some training together at, at, a, at a reduced price. Um, lastly, with the iSmart, and then we'll get into the topic. Uh, this is just kind of what one of the pages looks like when we grade an application or sell. Those of you who have not been part of this before. Um, we do try to make it collaborative, so we, we walk the floor with your small team and, and our you know select partner that we brought on to uh, to give us their their insights. And we want to meet with meet with the key stakeholders, obviously, and and look for those opportunities. Uh, the financials, uh, written report, it's a ten to twenty page report. It's you know a lot of pictures, you know, and uh, it's not a not an eye chart. We try to make it interesting and show you some some opportunities there. So. There's usually two or more applications that we look at when we're within a facility that uh, that fits kind of this quick win automation. All right, so let's move on to conveyor systems. Um, we're going to talk. There's you know conveying is everywhere. If you've been to an airport recently, um, you probably were on a conveyor, a people mover. Uh, so they're everywhere, not just in manufacturing, but uh, you know, certainly our Amazon fulfillment centers have you know miles, thousands of miles of these things, but Manufacturing. Um, today, we're going to talk about the different types with uh, belt conveyors, roller conveyors, chain conveyors, um, and kind of how they differ and where, where they kind of fit in, in the different verticals in manufacturing. So, probably seeing this belt conveyor. Um, oftentimes, there's you know sensors, cameras, vision systems mounted to uh, the conveyor as the parts go by to either do an inspection or detection of a feature. Um, you know, proximity sensor to detect is anything even there, which will trigger then an action further down the line for either a robot or uh, a diversion, you know, one way or another to a, a reject bin or a, a pass bin, uh, things like that. So there's some intelligence built into these things. Uh, this type, this type of chain conveyor, you know, a lot more heavy duty, top right. The bottom left conveyor, you've probably seen. Um, when it comes to like a powder coating facility or a uh, liquid paint line, so oftentimes these are overhead um, overhead pulleys that um, you, know, you can hang parts from, uh, a little bit slower moving, and, then, and obviously a lot of the traditional um, belt style conveyor, but uh, um, certainly serve a purpose and uh, have, have a lot of flexibility when it comes to the, the ability to hang different parts on the hooks uh, that are they're masked or um, you're ready to be sprayed, uh, and then potentially go through a uh, type of an oven um, for uh, for the final cure. Uh, these roller conveyors. So roller conveyors are interesting. They can be uh, motor powered, or they can be uh, just gravity based and um, you know, have, have no power behind them. So very simple. Obviously low maintenance, uh, fewer parts. Um, you know they can serpentine around. You know existing features. We're going to show you an example of that, uh, what a customer did a little bit later. Um, so these types of conveyors, and, and in the picture, you can even see a belt conveyor working with a roller conveyor. So a lot of these systems can work together depending on the speed, the, the item that's on it. Um, you know, if it's a food facility and, you, and, and things are getting exposed to chemicals or washes, you know, you have to get this, the size of conveyor that's going to be able to withstand uh, those liquids in the environment. So. Um, so that's why you might have a section that's sort of split off from the rest that uh, can handle you know, that environment. Um, so, so some several different types of conveyors here. A little bit of a comparison chart just as to what uh, what the strengths are. These are some of the most common found in manufacturing. 
Um, fabric belts can move with precision and in a clean manner versus uh, the metal chains, which aren't quite as precise, uh, but those metal chains can hold usually a, a much higher payload. Uh, I mentioned the gravity style rollers being the simplest. Um, they can be mounted with the motor or without. The distribution centers is what comes to mind with these most commonly. Um, and conveyors are often integrated with robots to maximize the total overall efficiency of the line. So um, at the end of the conveyor, there's usually um, a, either an operator or essentially a robot that, uh, that keeps the line still at fully automated, basically, in, in reducing, uh, reducing the reliance on manpower. All right, so switching over to feeders, uh, we've got vibratory feeders on the left here and centrifugal feeders on the right. We happen to be in central Indiana. We have, happen to have quite a few feeder bowl manufacturers and uh, design houses. So uh, I relied on a, a few of them for some uh, for some content here. Um, so the vibratory feeder on the left, it, it, it does what it sounds like. It, it uses vibration and um, really that, that instability uh, from the from the um, from the motor, from the motor the electromagnetic coils down below to gradually move parts up the ramp uh, vertically in a spiral uh, type of a pattern uh, before eventually you know, dropping those down in a more separated and, and intentional uh, flow downward to, um, to the, an outfeed area. Uh, so these, these can hold a large number of parts, uh, but they do have slower cycle times compared to a feeder like a centrifugal feeder. Uh, they can be uh, a little bit noisy, especially the larger ones, uh, a little disruptive to surrounding workers, so that definitely needs to be considered, and, and maybe some dampening uh, needs, needs to take place to alleviate that uh, that noise. Um, and, but they're very durable uh, and can and can move some heavier parts. On the on the right, we've got some triple feeder, which is is commonly used like in high speed packaging. So a lot of the examples I've seen are. Um, pharmaceuticals, uh, cosmetics, even small, uh, like lipstick bottles. Um, you know, the one I saw even recently was even a, a small liquor bottle that you see at a, like a gas station and moving like thousands of those, uh, you know, every few minutes is incredibly impressive, uh, the speed and the, the ability to dictate the part orientation. So the triple feeders are a little bit, a little different. They actually do spin. They're usually tilted at the inner disc. You see the black disc is tilted at an angle to really push parts out and rely on centrifugal force uh, to push parts out to the edge where they're then picked up by uh, at the loading area and then pushed up the ramp, uh, kind of similar at that point to how the vibratory feeder works. But they're much quieter. Uh, they usually require less maintenance. Um, they do need to be kept, uh, they, they need a level part feed. So usually it's not an operator that's constantly feeding these, there's a hopper or some other type of uh, pre-feed mechanism, which I'll go into a little bit later. So, you know, just be, be thinking about, you know, what are what are the goals? Like, yeah, these things are cool and they're a little bit mesmerizing when you watch them work uh, as, to, as to how they, and it's really an engineered marvel, at, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, but really, what are, we've got to keep in mind, what are, what are these intended for? And, you know, we, we have to, to start with, well, we're converting basically somebody dumping in parts or a hop, an automated hopper dumping both randomly oriented parts into this thing. So that the goal is they come out in a more organized, orientated, um, separated, you know, consistent flow when they leave the bowl. That's really the goal. And along the way, though, they can also be sort. They can be sorted by size, by feature. They can be inspected with vision, with uh, you know, sensors. Uh, they can be counted. Uh, so a lot of things can happen along the way other than just the actual um, you know, taking a mess and organizing it basically and producing a consistent flow. Um, you know, the last bullet point there, dropping dropping these into another bin that's not you know, organized or doesn't have any segregation to it kind of defeats the purpose. So it really needs to be something at, at the other end that ties in to um, uh, take advantage of what the, the bull has been doing. Um, other than maybe counting parts. So that's where a robot would come in. That's where this might lead to a larger conveyor line, so on and so forth. So here's a video of what a vibratory bowl kind of looks like in action. Uh, so you can, you'll see the hopper and blue dumping parts.
So these can be very small tabletop units um, that handle like fasteners all the way up to larger units that handle, you know, heavier metal parts. Notice the, the lids here are getting oriented uh, in the same orientation uh, consistently, and these cutaways, there's excess flow, if there's excess parts, the parts will drop through um, and be re recirculated to the bottom where they will start again and hopefully uh, make it to the main line ramp uh, on their next. Really fascinating, I think, the way this, these are designed. So these are starting to get collected in a linear type of a conveyor line here. Um, so this, everything is still flowing. There's no stoppage at this point. Parts can be counted. They can be inspected. Vision systems can be mounted onto these rails to uh, capture data that uh, you know, an operator wouldn't be able to do, obviously, at the same speed being achieved here. So pretty fascinating. This is another one uh, that's going to show you kind of how the parts are moved around a little bit more, as well as uh, an actual inspection integration. So again, a cutaway, taking taking out overflow parts, circulating them to the bottom, taking that upward. All the parts are now going through a tighter chute. See that little air nozzle blasting the parts forward. And here is the part where we've got a vision taking a very quick snapshot of this OD ID profile, comparing it to the data that's programmed as what what part. Those parts are being shot one way and the rejects are being shot the other way. Or blast. There's what bearing this D O D and ID or very, very high clip. Here they come. These are the good parts coming in, dropping into a bin. Obviously a higher value add would be to then move on to um, system that could package these or go to the next operation basically. That's a pretty good demonstration there, I thought. Moving on to centrifugal feeder bowl. Um, sound is going to be off for this one, but um, these are quieters, quieter systems. And you get a, seat, you get a sense for the speed with which these can rotate and uh, and really drive parts through compared to the, uh, the vibratory feeder. The parts are accumulating, really overflowing on the edge. The ramp is designed to only accept you know, parts that are you know, two to three wide, eventually going to a single wide lane, basically, and then overflow again, recirculating at the bottom, and then making a second attempt on the way up. Seeing the caps kind of stack up here, now they're moving down the line, so a signal has been sent that the queue has been filled and, and the parts are ready to move on to the next, uh, the next phase. The, uh, the comments there, the bullet points, the tooling is a big thing. So the, the tooling allows certain parts pass. So kind of a, um, you know, basically a, a tunnel, so to speak. Parts that are too tall will get clipped off and, and knocked to the bottom. Or if they're standing on end, basically, they would they'd not be in the proper orientation. So they're recycled, recirculated to the bottom in hopes that they would, uh, second attempt, they would make their way through. So that's usually with, with hard metal tooling. Um, the Bernoulli-style air jets are really clever. They will vacuum or blow air depending on the surface geometry that it's exposed to. So if it's, it can be programmed so that if a, a plastic you know, cap is, um, the opening is facing the jet, it will potentially leave it alone and leave with a vacuum. 
or if it's inverted, it will blow it uh, on one of the edges to flip it around 180 degrees. So pretty neat uh, engineering uh, feat there. So here's an example of, of a company that you know, they had some limited space with um, their current manufacturing layout, and they didn't want to move a lot of machines around or expand. So they they wanted to put some type of conveyor system in place. So they needed to look up. They had some vertical space upwards. So an integrator came in and and was able to utilize that, leaving the existing machine layout alone. Um, their, their volumes were mixed. They had a variety of SKUs. So they had to do some changeovers pretty frequently, and they needed a flexible option. So you know, with feeder bowls, you do have the ability to change out tooling and potentially in a matter of you know half day or less. I would say a lot of times you can accommodate a different part that may not fit um, one set of tooling. So they are uh, somewhat flexible. Uh, they can't be moved around very easily, of course, but uh, you know, feeder bowls can uh, accept different parts with different tooling configurations. Um, so, so the company took advantage of that, and this is a picture uh, courtesy of Portville Feeders. What they what they ended up doing is um, building this system 14 feet high off the ground to allow for fork trucks and, and normal floor, floor, excuse me floor traffic to resume. And then these conveyors, um, the pre-feeder was basically the, the the bowl. So it fed these, these conveyors similar to how you saw in the centrifugal feeder uh, example with the parts. Um, going out those those three conveyor lines, um, this would be the next step where they could be again inspected, um, you know, verified, day coded, anything that needed to be done before finally going to the two robots on the floor um, several aisles away that would then take them and potentially package them or um, do the next oper perform the next operation. So uh, I thought this was pretty clever combining a feeder bowl with a conveyor with a robot all in one kind of unique cell with an elevated conveyor uh, that you don't see quite as often. I mentioned pre-feeders, especially with centrifugal type feeder bowls, uh, because you need a consistent part level um, to, to really capture the full efficiency of the centrifugal feeder. So some, these are some of the examples. Um, vibratory hopper, uh, vibratory elevator, which I'm going to show you a stepped elevator um, example here in a little bit. Live bottom hopper, which you know some some of the more troublesome parts they they like to say when it comes to sticky parts, um, heavy, large. Um, you know, they, they come with custom drive motor and gearbox combinations. So there's lots of lots of pre-feeder options, just like there are feeder bowl options. Um, we're just talking about some trip forward and vibratory being two of the most common, but there are others as well. Um, and then the drag through elevator is, is a really efficient one. Just think of kind of dumping a dumping a lot of parts in and forgetting it, and uh, you know, coming back once that level is, is depleted and, and needs refilled. Um, these can be designed for um, various discharge levels and heights, and uh, as well as the bin size. Here's an example of that. Um, this is a very flexible unit, so they're, they're going to accommodate. Usually cylindrical parts, um, taking advantage of their ability to roll down a chute um, to the next station. Um, but you'll notice no hard tooling is needed to change out when we go from part to part here. So uh, it's going to be a very affordable and flexible um, piece of automation. I remind you of the uh, point game at the uh, not vertically at it. So the step, the width of the steps can vary, and that can be changed out with the different adapters. Basically, if it needs to say a wider part or a greater number of parts, the these can act alone or as the NP2 robot. That's a two-step elevator. Uh, so what will, what might happen with on the end on the outfeed on the other end of that uh, feeder might be a, a a chute that leads to a conveyor. And this video is an example of how a robot could be at the end of that chute conveyor 
um, picking up fasteners and doing a screw driving or a riveting operation. Yeah. Pretty straightforward, but again, fully automated once the parts have been dumped in by an operator or some sort of material movement. Uh, this is uh, getting closer to full automation. This is a flex feeder. Um, this is an example of this category. It's getting relatively new to the mainstream. I think it's been around a little bit longer than people are aware of, but um, this is interesting because you don't really need to change out any tooling and you can. Um, perform uh, quite a few activities on this um, conveyor belt that's nearest the camera here. Uh, kind of combines the step elevator, uh, the hopper, the vib vibratory hopper, and a conveyor line uh, to accommodate a number of different parts. And this can potentially be moved around. Uh, I think it's a little bit of a lighter weight system, so potentially could be moved around the plant um, for some of the smaller model numbers. Parts are trying to be separated so that the vision of a robot ripper could come in and pick the parts off the fair instead of being punched up at the are So this type of hybrid system is an example of how to drop in one system into your facility with no interchangeable tooling, just pro different programs, and still be able to inspect, pick, and sort a variety of smaller parts, um, either mixed or segregated across multiple SKUs uh, without having a fully dedicated operator for that station. And this is just an example of how you can, you can implement a um, Heating system and conveyor system really before you have a robot at the end of the line. You can always you know, put an operator here at least part of the time to act as the, the picker. Um, this is, looks like a, like a seat belt type of uh, a nail fitting. It's been stamped and, and, uh, and formed. Um, going to the end of the line after essentially being inspected, this can be then put into a box or go to you know, the next station where it's being assembled. You can always drop in a robot later. Uh, it's more difficult to say more difficult, but sometimes it doesn't make as much sense to have a robot there first before you have an improper feeding system. So with robots, you know, they, they can't pick parts nearly as well as humans, right? If you just have a mixed random amount of parts in a bin, all sorts of orientations, um, we need a very intelligent vision system attached to that robot to, to process what is what so they know what to grip especially if you're talking about segregated parts. So um, oftentimes being able to present the parts in a, in a much more organized, straightforward manner, consistent manner, um, like these like these feeders and conveyor combinations can present is the, is the way to go. And then you can drop in the robot um, much easier um, when you're ready to, uh, to fully automate that section. So just wrapping up um, some key points, we've got feeder bowls and conveyor systems can be a solution when it comes to, to part sorting, presentation, and continuous flow to a robot. Um, we are seeing automation payback periods under 18 months, uh, you know, some of these applications that we look at. So if that, if that sounds good to you, we certainly want to talk to you uh, and, and get your thoughts on uh, what applications you have in mind and, and what, what other areas that you have some pain points in that we might be able to, uh, to help you out with. So tasks as inspect such as inspection, sorting, and grouping um, parts together. Uh, if you have a mixed, again, if you have a mixed uh, family of parts, um, that sorting activity inspection can be achieved while the feeder bowl is is um, you know, organizing, so to speak, the, the bulk parts that have been dumped in the bin. So 
um, from point A to point B that can take place and uh, and not be have to be done down the line, saving a lot of time and efficiency, gaining efficiency. Um, so takeaways from here, like I said, identify select areas of your manufacturing process that you feel could be candidates for uh, automation um, and, and contact us. Uh, whether you're in Indiana, definitely want to work with Purdue, uh, but in, in other states, um, Illinois and Iowa are part of the iSmart program as well. Uh, and I, I have, have contacts in those uh, MEPs as well. So uh, appreciate you uh, attending today. And just lastly, I'll leave you with some future uh, events we've got coming up with uh, on the left here is Purdue MEP workshops. So you can see Six Sigma, some quality uh, internal auditor training uh, later in June. We're talking about some cyber, some food security, food, <laughs> excuse me, food and manufacturing preventive controls. Um, and then our friends at um, Cirrus and, and Red and IMAC there, if you want to jot down the links, they have their own workshops uh, going on as well. Uh, the webinars, I should say, that, that might be relevant to Indiana and, and other states. Um, they have a couple interesting ones, the, the, how automation in millennials will change the manufacturing world. That will be interesting coming up Thursday this week. And then we've got an OSHA event uh, that IMAC is putting on. So. Um, Appreciate you guys attending today. I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, it doesn't look like, uh, if you want to take a minute, if you do have a question, feel free to put that in the chat for the Q&A, and I will take a look at it and do my best to respond. It's my email and our in our MEP website, uh, link there below. If you have any needs, automation related or not, feel free to contact us.